We're talking about the Opium Wars. Um, back in the 1800s, um, actually late 1700s, Britain was trying very hard to get permission to do more trade with China for the very simple reason that China had products that the British people very much wanted. They wanted silks, they wanted porcelains, but most especially, they wanted tea. The problem was that at that point in time, late 17, early 1800s, China was very restrictive on their trade policies. For instance, there was only one port, the port of Canton or Guangzhou, that the British were allowed to trade in. And they had very tight rules. They could not leave the port, they could not learn Chinese, and the only way that they could, um, could purchase the products from the, the Chinese, they couldn't trade for them because the British quite simply didn't have anything that the Chinese wanted. But if the, if the British wanted to get Chinese tea and Chinese silk and porcelain, especially tea, they had to pay silver for it. It was a purely cash economy. Well, for Britain, that was especially problematic because Britain doesn't have any silver mines. So the British were having to go to Mexico and buy Mexican silver dollars in order to have the money to take to China to pay for the things they wanted. And by 1800, they were importing six tons of tea. That's a lot of tea. Tea doesn't weigh that much. So, and it was getting more and more all the time. And this trade imbalance was, was killing the, the British. They were allowed at that time to import a small amount of opium, which was grown in India. The poppies were grown in India, and of course, India was part of the British Commonwealth at that point. That was the jewel in the crown of the British Empire. And so they were allowed to bring in a small amount of opium for medicinal purposes, because there are some Chinese medicine treatments that will use small amounts of opium, but it wasn't very much. In the process of doing that small amount of opium trade that was legal uh, for medicine in China, the British found out, the British East India Company discovered that Illegally, there were traders in China who really wanted to be able to get more opium, not so they could use it for medicine, but so they could use it to people who were addicted to the drug. And so they began in the early 1800s to import illegally more and more opium. There were strict laws against importing or selling opium in China. But the British, completely disregarding the law in China, began to import more and more opium starting in the 1800s, and this became a real problem for the Chinese. Not only was it illegal, but it was estimated that with, by the um, mid-1830s, as many as 90% of the young males in East China, and you remember from maps we looked at earlier that almost all the cities in China are along the eastern part of the country, eastern and north. So all the population areas, they estimated that 90% of the young adult males in China became addicted to opium. It was opium that was smoked in opium dens. It was much more powerful than when they would grind it up and put it in medicines. Um, and so people were getting addicted to it. There was a huge drop off in people. People stopped going to work. The military, they had a massive problem with, um, with soldiers not showing up for duty. Um, and it got so bad that by the late 1800s, the um, Dao Guang Emperor at that time said, if this continues, we not only will have no men for our army, but we'll have no money to support the army, to equip them. Because it had gone from being a huge cash inflow to China, all of the silver that they were getting, because now they were uh, trading opium for it. They weren't their products were being traded for opium and they weren't getting the silver. So their financial economy, their hard currency had crashed in terms of the availability and their young men were all getting addicted to opium. And the British were continuing to do this with the support of the British government and the British East India Company. So this became a huge problem. Um, in, in fact, they said that by 1839, the opium trade was equivalent to two and a half times the national budget of the Chinese Qing Empire. I mean, that's how much opium was going into to China. Well, the emperor said, we gotta do something about this. And all of this was happening in Canton. And Canton, or Guangzhou as it's called today, um, had become a center for vice and corruption and crime and anti-imperial um, 
difficulties. They were all against the emperor because he was trying to suppress the trade that they all wanted to continue because it was making people rich and it was providing drugs to those who were addicted. So in 1839, the emperor appoints a new governor of Canton, Governor Lin Zhe Chu, and, and he is a rabid anti-opium uh, guy. He comes in and immediately takes action. Uh, in the first few weeks that he's in Canton, he makes 1,600 arrests, including British uh, citizens. He confiscates 42,000 opium pipes and confiscates 20,000 150 pound chests of opium. That gives you some idea how much opium was going in at that point. He takes the opium, uh, early, you know, there were a few smaller amounts that he burned, but when he had so much, 20,150 pound chests, he had them placed in ditches, and that's what this painting up here is reflecting. Um, he had them placed in ditches, covered in lime, and then soaked with seawater, so that the opium was of no value anymore, it couldn't be used. Well, the British are going nuts about this. They estimated that at this one point, um, the governor, the new governor, had destroyed nine million pounds, that is, British sterling pounds, of opium. And that was a lot more money back then than, than 11 million pounds is now. So the, a particular event happened that made it even worse. In almost every case, things get really tense and then something will happen that causes it to blow up. In July of 1839, um, a number of British and American sailors from one of the opium clipper ships got drunk and went on a rampage in Kowloon. Kowloon is the, the coastal area around Hong Kong. And of course, Hong Kong still belonged to China at that point. It does again, but there were, you know, we'll talk about why it ended up being British because this is, this is the reason. Um, but in Kowloon, these guys went, went, got drunk, they went on a rampage, they killed a Chinese man, and they vandalized a Buddhist temple. Well, they got back aboard their ships, and the Chinese demanded that they be given these guys to try them for their crimes, and the British refused to release them. Well, the Chinese issued a new policy that no one could trade in China unless they agreed to obey all of the Chinese laws, and that the Chinese could hold them responsible for that. The British didn't like that, and because of that, um, they ended up uh, blockading the Pearl River, which is the river that comes out right in Hong Kong. They ended up shelling some of the shore emplacements around the country, and they began, at that point, a war that lasted two and a half years. It is called the First Opium War, in which Great Britain and China were at war to force China, basically, to allow opium to be imported. I want to read you a quote. This is from a British citizen named Thomas Arnold, no relationship to me as far as I know. Um, he wrote this, this war with China really seems to be so wicked as to be a national sin of the greatest possible magnitude and it distresses me very deeply. Cannot anything be done by petition or otherwise to awaken men's minds to the dreadful guilt we are incurring? I really do not remember in any history of a war undertaken with such combined injustice and baseness. Ordinary wars of conquest are to me far less wicked than to go to war in order to maintain smuggling, and that smuggling consisting in the introduction of a demoralizing drug which the government of China wishes to keep out and which we, for our lucre of gain, want to introduce by force and in this quarrel are going to burn and slay in the pride of our supposed superiority. So for two and a half years, Britain and China are at war, and Britain by far gets the best of it. For two and a half years, they win virtually every land battle, they win virtually every sea battle. In fact, there is nothing, the navy of the Chinese uh, military are all wooden junks. That's not a, a, a quality evaluation, that's what they're called, the Chinese junk, it's the ship. And so this is the uh, Nemesis, which was an ironclad um, side wheeler of the British Navy, and it basically the Nemesis was controlling whole area around Hong Kong and the Pearl River, and they were just destroying all of the Navy. They were destroying all of the, uh, the shore batteries that were used for the protection of China. It was a very ugly circumstance. Um, but the British Navy was particularly uh, of value to them in this battle. After two and a half years, over 18,000 Chinese were killed and 69 British. 
that give you some idea of the imbalance in terms of the military power of the Chinese versus the British at this point. Um, this map gives you an idea that the British were controlling the shoreline from all the way down here in Hong Kong and Macau, all the way up the coast. They captured Shanghai, they uh, were up to Tianjin and Beijing, so all along the coast the British were controlling it, and they took the various cities. Finally, in mid-1842, when the British seized Shanghai, after two and a half years of consistent defeats uh, by the, for the Chinese, the Chinese sued for peace um, and said, we can't, can't keep doing this because we don't stand a chance. So the Chinese are forced to sign a treaty, which is called the Treaty of Nanj Nanking. The city's been called Nanjing and Nanking at different times. Um, but the Treaty of Nanking on August 29th of 1842 forced concessions um, on the Chinese that the British wanted. Now this is the first of what were called the uh, treaties, the unequal treaties. There were a whole series of these that China had to endure during their century of humiliation or century of embarrassment, it's sometimes called, where every other Western power was taking advantage of them. Well, the concessions in the Treaty of Nan, uh, Nanking, it increased the number of ports that the British could go to to five rather than one. It gave the island of Hong Kong to the British. That's why they controlled uh, Hong Kong for um, over 150 years. It was only in the last few years that they officially gave it back to China. Um, it's gave the British the rights of extraterritoriality. What that means is that no British citizen in China could be held accountable for by Chinese law. That they could only be held accountable by the British law and the British could, could do it. So it's, it was like diplomatic immunity for everybody who was from Britain who was in China. Um, it also gave Britain a most favored nation status. What that means is that at any time that China gave any benefits to any other country, they automatically had to give those same benefits to, to Britain. Um, they created an enormous hardship because in addition to all of that, the Chinese were forced to pay $21 million in silver as reparations. They had to pay for all of the, the war. Um, you see why it's called an unequal treaty. It not only caused a great economic hardship, but it also really was a blow to the prestige. China had always been seen as being the power in the Far East. And here they got completely obliterated in this two and a half year war with the British. A lot of other countries noticed this. Russia noticed it, and particularly Japan noticed it. When I talked, uh, the first lecture I did about the Japanese and the two um, Chinese-Japanese wars, those were really caused by the fact that the opium wars proved to the Japanese that China was not nearly as strong as everybody thought they were. And so that made a huge difference. But that wasn't enough for the British at this point. And again, I love the British. I love England. Uh, um, I, could, I could sing, you know, but I won't, no, I won't do that. Um, <laughs> a few years later, in the 1850s, the British decided they wanted more. The, the uh, Chinese had been understandably reluctant to fulfill all of the uh, promises that were made in the Nanking Treaty, and so they were dragging their feet a little bit. In the 1950s, the British come back and they demand even more concessions. They demand that, that uh, China open all of their ports to free trade. They demand that they pay zero tariffs for anything they bring into the country, and that China has to make opium legal to open the trade that they can bring in as much opium as they want. They also wanted to have a full-time ambassador in Beijing that had uh, authority to negotiate with the government, which they no other country had, and they wanted to increase the trade in indentured servants, coolies as they were called back then, which were unskilled laborers. Basically they were slaves. It was somebody who you didn't have to pay, you paid a fee to get their services. Well Britain, once they gained this, they ended up selling a lot of those indentured servants to America and the Transcontinental Railway in the United States was primarily built by Chinese laborers who had been sold as indentured servants, which is a fancy word of saying slave, to America by the British because of all this. Well, the, um, after the British made these additional demands, 
we had another event that sparked, you know, the sort of lit the fuse, and that was called the Arrow Event. On October 8th of 1856, the Chinese officials went on board a British flagged vessel, but it had Chinese sailors on it, and they, they took 12 Chinese crewmen off, put them under arrest for piracy and smuggling. The British demanded that they give them back. And the Chinese were unwilling to do that at first, but the British insisted, and knowing what had happened a few years earlier, the Chinese gave the 12 Chinese sailors back to the British. Well, just to make a point, the British shelled 20 shore, destroyed 20 shore defensive batteries and uh, more than 20 ships of the Chinese just to prove that they could do it, even after the soldiers had been released. Um, and they decided that they were going to have to go to war again to force China to give them all these additional things they were asking for. The same point, China was actually in a worse condition now to be able to defend themselves than previously because they were undergoing what was called the Taipei Rebellion. The Taipei Rebellion was a very weird religious uprising that really did threaten China during this period of time in the mid-1800s. Um, it was, it was pseudo-Christian. The fellow who started this rebellion, he claimed it was a Christian movement, but he also claimed he was the little brother of Jesus. And so it was kind of a very strange thing. Well, the Chinese were fighting this rebellion, and one of the things that had happened in part of that is um, Westerners were not allowed to go outside certain areas and share their religion. You know, uh, China was protective of their Buddhist and Confucian beliefs, and so they did not want Christianity to be openly shared. Well, there was a French priest who was a missionary who had gone outside those areas, and he had been in contact and interaction with the, the leaders of the Taipei Rebellion. So he was arrested and executed by the Chinese. So the British when they decide they want to have another war to prove that they can get anything they want out of China, they invite the French to join them. They also invited the Americans, and the Americans didn't. But the French joined in with them. So the Second Opium War, which began in 1856, was actually a combined effort between the British and the French to fight against the Chinese. Here you have a French cavalry uh, charge against the Chinese uh, soldiers. In the, this period of war, the Chinese did a little better. Um, they ended up with between, well, up to between 12 and 30,000. They never had exact numbers on this. Between 12 and 30,000 Chinese killed in the Second Opium War, and 2,900 Western troops were killed. The Chinese were forced again to sign a punitive treaty, the Treaty of Tianjin, uh, and it forced them to open more ports. It gave any foreigner with a passport the freedom to travel anywhere they want. It gave Christian missionaries the freedom to, um, to spread their uh, message wherever they wanted. And the uh, Chinese Christians were given back all of their property rights. If you became a Christian in China up to that time, then you, you, know, you had limited rights after that. But in addition to that, China had to pay a huge further indemnity to both Britain and to France. So they had to pay the cost of this again. The Russia got involved in this. They took advantage of it because they decided we want, another, we want a port a little further south than what they had. So they ended up taking the whole left bank of the Amur River away from, uh, in Manchuria, away from China, and they built the port of Vladivostok. So they basically just took the property that Vladivostok was built on. and. Um, Again, one of the problems with this is that it created a downward spiral in terms of both confidence, but how, but the prestige, how China was perceived by the rest of the world, and most especially the Japanese. And it led directly to the horrors of the Boxer Rebellion, which came in 1900, not too many years after this. Um, and both Russia and Japan became absolutely convinced at this point that they could defeat China if it came to a war, whereas they would not have thought that before. We then, here's another image of the Westerners, you'll notice the uniform here, fighting against the Chinese. That then leads us to the Boxer Rebellion. The Boxer Rebellion uh, was, was a direct product of all that had happened in China's relationship with the West. It, is, it was an effort by 
indigenous Chinese to rid the country of what they call the influence of foreign devils. Um, it was because of the loss of prestige, the loss of power, and the frustration of helplessness over not being able to do anything to keep these foreign powers from coming in, and especially since it involved them uh, bringing opium in, which was they saw as destroying the fabric of their country. In addition to that, there were a number of different places like Hong Kong and, and the Vladivostok, other areas as well that had become centers of what they called spheres of influence for Western powers. Basically, that meant property that they had taken away from China and that they were controlling, like Hong Kong at this point. But in, 19, um, in 1894 and 95, when Japan had been defeated, or Japan defeated China, on top of the two opium war losses, the, beep, the frustration, and then a two-year, serious two-year drought led the Chinese to say something's gotta be done. And in the Shandong province, there were a group of young men, the drought had taken away their work. They, they were, nothing was growing in the fields and they could not work in the fields. So they were without work and they formed a society, a martial arts society, which was called the Society of the Righteous and Harmonious Fist. And they decided that they were going to do something about this horrendous Western influence and all that they had done. So the Boxer Rebellion was the result of that. It was a violent, anti-foreign, anti-colonial, anti-Christian, specifically, uh, rebellion on the part of first these martial artists. And they were called the Boxers because they would gather in public squares and go through their martial arts exercises, sort of like Tai Chi, except more with blows. And the Westerners would see them, and they had no description for this other than to say, it looks like they're boxing. And so it became known as the Boxer Rebellion. Um, the, the first effort that they made in the Boxer Rebellion was they attacked a German missionary um, center they did not get the primary, the leader of the mission there, but they did kill two German priests that were on site, which caused Kaiser Wilhelm, the head of Germany at that point, to, to say something has to be done, and he said he was going to send troops. He was the first one to really commit to that. But in addition to that, the boxers in Beijing, they forced foreign diplomats and um, soldiers and Chinese Christians into an isolated area in the legation quarter, the sort of uh, ambassador's quarter of the city. And they were closed in there and they ended up being under siege for 55 days. That's what the Charlton Heston movie, 55 Days in Peking is about because, it, and it was called Peking then. I still call it Beijing when I talk about it because you're used to that. But uh, it was called Peking at that time. And so for 55 days, these people, were trapped in a certain part of the city, uh, surrounded by these boxers. The boxers were shooting at them through cracks in the walls and things, and so they were suffering various casualties all along. They, uh, over the period of time, they began to run out of food, they began to run out of, of uh, ammunition to defend themselves. They were suffering from dysentery and smallpox. It was a very bad situation for them all the way around. And one of the things that happened is these boxers, as they marched into the capital, they were, they were chanting, support the Qing government and exterminate the foreigners. Well, the Dowager Empress, um, Si Qi, at that point, and I can show you a picture of her in a minute, um, she was the power behind the throne. Her son was the emperor, but she was really the one in charge. And at first, she immediately thought, we have to put down this rebellion. And then she realized that the boxers were saying, support the Qing government, and throw out the foreigners, and she decided maybe they could succeed where we were not able, um, from a political point of view, and get rid of the foreigners, and get rid of the foreign influence. So she ended up supporting the Boxer Rebellion, as did a number of other government officials in uh, China at that point. There are a lot of images from the Boxer Rebellion. You know, people were very active with their, their Browning cameras back then, I think. Um, this is actually an image of one of the fighters that are on the boxer side with his spear and shield and a banner proclaiming his commitment. This is a group of Chinese Christians. Um, Christianity had spread quite a bit in China at that point, and Chinese Christians were, if they weren't killed, they were forced to flee. And so uh, 20, I think 25,000 were forced to flee their homes, and this is an example. These three gentlemen down here are three Catholic Christians 
Chinese Catholics who are preparing to defend their church from the boxers and uh, the devastation that they were causing. So um, the boxers also, because they were a martial arts society, and they had, they had this belief that by breath control and by swallowing talismans and by allowing themselves to be controlled by spirits, that they would be invulnerable to any Western weapon, that bullets and swords could not hurt them. And so they were quite fearless in attacking because they thought that nothing could hurt them. And they believed that if they allowed themselves to be possessed and went into a trance, if the whole group of them could do that at once, then nothing could defeat them. And so there was this weird kind of uh, courage that they created at that point. Christian converts were the special target, um, and it didn't matter what, whether they were Catholic or Protestant, there was no difference. They were influenced by Westerners, and so therefore they needed to be gotten rid of. And a particular reason for that is the indigenous Chinese, who were still either Confucian or Buddhists, whenever there were difficulties, like the two-year drought I just mentioned, they would gather together everyone in the community and they would pray to their ancestors and to the kami, the spirits, I'm using a Japanese word there, but to the, to the spirits, the deities, and pray for rain. Well, the Chinese converts to Christianity wouldn't do that. They would not get together and pray to their ancestors or to the spirits. And so the Confucian and Buddhist Chinese believed that rain was not coming, the drought was lasting because the, the Christians would not pray to their ancestors and gods. And they also developed these rumors that the Christians were, were killing people and taking their organs to make magic potions. They believed they were poisoning wells. There were all sorts of things. And so there was a, a concerted effort to try to destroy, to kill as many of the Chinese Christians as possible and as many of the missionaries as possible and also to destroy their churches. We don't know exactly how many of the Chinese Christians were killed, but we know that it was at least 25,000 and more. In addition to the Confucian and Buddhists that were having difficulty with the, uh, the Chinese Christians, these guys here are Muslims. There is a, uh, an ethnic group in China called the Hui, H-U-I, who are Muslim. And they, too, had a problem with all the Western influence because particularly the opium thing, that Britain was introducing opium because in the Muslim faith, any intoxicating drug is considered uh, absolute sin and not allowable. So 10,000 of these Wei young men got together and formed a small army. They called themselves the Kansu Braves, and they marched all the way to Beijing to fight on the side of the boxers. They ended up being sort of the personal guard of the, uh, of the Dowager Empress uh, Sichi. She and her son ended up being sneaked out of Beijing uh, because she was afraid that they were going to hold her responsible for the uh, Boxer Rebellion. She eventually agreed to the peace and the protocols, and so she was not held accountable. But um, there were uh, quite a few senior officials in the Qing government who were executed over this, according to the protocols that they agreed to. And again, um, whereas Sichi, the uh, Dowager Empress, was at first not, you know, at first she wasn't in support of this, she then decided that this might be some, what we need to get rid of the foreign influence that she wasn't happy about either. Well, China, the Imperial Guard now, uh, the Imperial Army rather, is fighting on the side of the boxers. So eight countries formed an alliance and sent military, sent soldiers, all eight of them, to China in order to protect the foreign citizens and the legations and other people there. Um, the picture you see here, they lined all of them up so that you can get an example. In order left to right, these are troops from Britain, the United States, Russia, India, Germany, France, Austro-Hungary, Italy, and Japan. The British was actually British Commonwealth. There were Indian and uh, there's nine people there because the Indian uh, fellow was considered part of the British Commonwealth Army, but 21,000 Japanese, 13,000 Russians, 12,000 from the British Commonwealth, 3,500 French, 3,500 from the United States, as well as assorted Austro-Hungarians, Germans, and Italians shipped in to try to stop this rebellion and basically just, you know, came in force into the country. This is them being unloaded. Of course, back in those days, they used primarily horses. This is the German military. 
And Kaiser Wilhelm, when he sent them off uh, from Germany, when they were loading on the boats to go to China to fight the Boxer Rebellion, he did this rousing speech to them and said, and when you go to, you know, to China, I want you to fight like Huns, which is why later on in the First World War especially, the Germans were called Huns, because Kaiser Wilhelm said, I want you to fight like Huns. He also said, from, from this day forward, I don't want a Chinese person ever to see a German without shaking in fear. You know, so they were determined that they were gonna be rough about this. In fact, the Germans and the Russians were guilty of so much pillaging and rape, looting and rape, that uh, the other forces, particularly the, the Americans and the Japanese, on several occasions, had to turn their guns on the Germans and the Russians to keep them from raping and looting, which is kind of strange for the Japanese to do that when you realize that it wasn't very much, very long after this that you know you had the Japanese how they conducted themselves uh, in China. But as they came in, the everything was going really well for the boxers up until um, July of 1900, and these soldiers started coming in from the other places. They landed in Tianjin, marched up to Beijing. They after 55 days they. Um, broke the siege against the legation quarter in the 55 days, again, is why the, the movie 55 Days in Peking. Um, and the, the foreign troops, after they had defeated the boxers in Beijing, they went on a looting rampage and claimed that it was their right as reparations, that they could loot the city. Um, they started gathering up anyone who was expected or suspected of being part of the boxer rebellion. Um, this is an image of various of the boxers or suspected boxers being held for a uh, trial or in many cases it was just summary execution. Uh, the vast majority of them didn't get a trial and we have no record of any who were tried. This is a trial in front of a, a Chinese judge of accused boxers. We have no record of any of the accused boxers ever being acquitted of the crimes and the punishment for those crimes was execution, execution by uh, beheading. The thing they discovered down here is that since they were executing people by beheading, the Japanese were especially good at that. They had been more trained in the use of the sword than any of the other peoples, and so they ended up doing a lot of the executing, cutting off of people's heads. And this rather grotesque macabre picture there are two of the boxer heads with their heads <laughs> suspended on uh, by their, their pigtail kind of thing. So at this point, the Emperor Sichi agrees that um, they will sign the protocol. It's called the Boxer Protocols, and they had a peace agreement on September 7th of 1901. But again, so many people were gathered up, and many of them summarily executed. The American general on the scene, whose name was Adna Chaffee, he said this, uh, it is safe to say that where, uh, where one real boxer has been killed, 50 harmless coolies or laborers on the farms, including not a few women and children, have been slain. It was a bloodbath. And they didn't really care whether most of these people were guilty or not. Um, again, the reparations that had to be paid to, uh, after this, uh, China had to pay all of the eight nationalities that had come in a total of 450 million teals of silver. That's the equivalent of 600 million ounces of silver. It was worth 11 billion dollars. It bankrupted China. Now they had 39 years to pay this off, but if you can imagine, in those days, 11 uh, billion dollars worth of silver that they had to pay. Here's an uh, image of Chinese executioners killing uh, more of the uh, those who were suspected of being part of the Boxer Rebellion. So between 20 and 30,000 Chinese Christians were killed, 20,000 imperial troops died, 20,000 civilians that we know of were killed. Now those numbers are not for sure. They didn't have exact ways of counting, and those are estimates. The only number that we know for sure is that there were 526 foreign soldiers killed. Uh, we know exactly how many they were because they kept count. And then hundreds of foreign missionary men, women, and children were killed. Um, again, we don't have any better numbers than that. As a result of this and the weakness that China had demonstrated both through the, um, the two opium wars, the defeat by Japan in the first Sino-Japanese War, and then the defeat and the reparations being paid by the Boxer Rebellion,
It was not very long after this, 1912, when the Qing Empire, or the Qing Dynasty of the Chinese Empire, collapsed. It was the last of the empires and the start of the Republic of China. This is a French cartoon which shows, because the Qing Empire were Manchus, they were not ethnic Han, uh, they were Manchus. This is a Manchurian um, here, and it shows uh, Queen Victoria, her grandson, Kaiser Wilhelm, the uh, Russian um, representative here. This is Marianne, a, rep a representation of France, and then a Japanese samurai deciding how they're going to carve up China while the Chinese uh, Manchu behind them is going nuts over this. And this is very much what happened. And again, it led to the destruction in just a few years after this, 10 years after this, to the complete um, collapse of the Qing Empire and the imperial dynasties of China. Questions about any of that? The two opium wars, the, uh, the Boxer Rebellion, or anything related to that? Yes? Where was the opium coming from? It was coming from India. India was part of the British Empire. The, where was the opium coming from was the question. It, um, they were growing poppies in India. Now, the British get very tight control of that. They didn't allow it to get out of hand in India. You know, they, would, they would not allow it to be used in their areas, but they were taking the poppy, uh, the, the opium, from India and using it in exchange for what they wanted, which was the tea from China. And so that's how they offset the problem they had with the trade balance. Okay. Yes. So in 1948, there were still areas that were under administration by the British and others. Well, in 1948, I mean, after 1945, when China had, you know, they had been fighting the Japanese, they had been devastated um, by the Japanese. When the Allies came in, and this is true in Korea, and uh, we'll talk about Korea over the next few days, it was true in Korea, but it was also true in areas of Japan, because there were still Japanese troops there uh, when the Allies in 1945 when the Japanese surrendered there were still Japanese troops in various areas in some cases they had not received the word that they had you know that the Emperor had ordered them to surrender and so various of the Allied troops came into areas especially major cities just to make sure that all of that was dealt with and everything was calmed down and they stuck around for a number of years so 1948 would have been not very long after that and so if you if there were British or other allied kind of uh, government controls there, it was because they were still trying to settle everything down after the Japanese had, had created a very difficult situation for both the Koreans and for the Chinese. That wasn't the result of treaties with China. No, it wasn't. Uh, if it was Shanghai, it would not have been because of any unequal treaties. It would have been as a result of trying to clean up everything after the, after the Second World War. So, other questions? And there they sat stunned for some moments. <laughs> it, it, oh, yes, here. The, uh, when Hong Kong was turned over to Chinese, that was 1996, was it? 97? Sounds right. It was, it was on the basis that a 99 year lease had uh, expired. Yeah. Which would have made it like 95, 96. Well, actually, when Hong Kong was first given to the British, the question is was it a 99 year lease and, you know, one would have ended? Because they took it over in the 1840s. And so um, when they first took it over, it was in perpetuity. The agreement was that they would control Hong Kong forever and the British. And then later on, I think they may have agreed to a limited contract by which they would then step out. And, you know, China is not dumb. They realize that Hong Kong is doing very well, thank you. And they want that, you know, business. And so it's now the Hong Kong self-administered region. Um, the and the the HK uh, SAR because they're allowing Hong Kong to continue on and ev everything that they were doing before they're not messing with them you don't see as much restrictions it's not as difficult to get into Hong Kong as it is to other parts of China etc so while China has taken it over Hong Kong has not changed very much and I think that was the agreement at the time but initially the British were supposed to get Hong Kong forever and then later on after the second Opium War they also were given Kowloon. Uh, and various other of these eight nations were given various other properties. The Germans, for instance, controlled a number of areas around ports in China. And when the Germans were defeated in the Second World War, um, the Allies had to decide, okay, who are we going to give those to? 
And somebody said, well, maybe we should give them back to China because various other countries wanted to be able to go in and take over this Chinese property that the Germans had controlled since the Boxer Rebellion, so for 44 years. Um, but most of that area, has those kinds of isolated uh, spheres of influence have been given back to China now, although you do see a lot of foreign influence in those places. Yes? And was a Stalin requirement to give it back to China? Yeah, well, Stalin was, was saying give it back to China as well because he, he was hoping that by... Uh, that gets complicated. We'll talk about that a little bit when we talk about Korea, because Korea was the ultimate example where there was a gamesmanship being played between um, Mao in, in China, but even more so between Stalin and between the Western allies, most especially the United States. They were trying to see how much control they could gain in the region without being pushed to war. And so Stalin was dictating both to North Korea, because they had set up the, the communist regime in North Korea, and also to Mao at that point, because China was still trying to get its legs under itself. He wanted to see how far they could push the West without America declaring war on Russia, because they were afraid that might happen. We'll talk about that when we talk about the Korean War as well. Anything else? Well, thank you all very much. Oh, yes, sorry. Go ahead. Well, so uh, did China not have armaments of some kind? Well, the British had um, steel ships with long-range guns. The Chinese had wooden, um, you know, wooden junks with very limited firepower. Even though they had invented gunpowder, they had not perfected the kind of weaponry. Uh, the military that they had, you remember in some of the images I showed you when the Chinese fought against the Japanese, the Japanese had modernized their, their uniforms, their weapons, everything was very modern. The Chinese were still wearing traditional robes, using, and many of them were still using bows and arrows. And so they had gone a little bit further than that by the time they're, you know, they're some of the British things, but not, you know, they, they still were not very advanced compared to a major Western power. Thank you all very much.